they will come to order. Today we will be considering the three bills on government transparency and several postal name resolutions. Each of three bills we will consider today were approved by this committee by partisan votes in the past Congress. So I hope you will continue to work cooperatively to move these bills forward. H.R. 1323. I now call on H.R. 1323, Reducing Information Control Designation Act, which was introduced by Representative Steve Drivers. This is a companion bill to H.R. 854, the bill on overclassification that the committee approved last month. I ask unanimous consent that H.R. 1323 be considered as read and open for an amendment at any point. Without objection, so ordered. Without objection, I yield to the sponsor of the bill, Mr. Dryhouse, to describe the bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, thanks for considering the Reducing Information Control Designations Act. Uh, this is a common sense bill that will increase openness and transparency in government. Uh, the bill, as was mentioned by the chairman, uh, was introduced by Chairman Waxman in the last session, with the primary co-sponsor being Ranking Member Congressman Davis. Uh, as both the chairman and ranking member this session have noted, at the start, we share a responsibility to protect the interests of the American people. This committee has already addressed overclassification through H.R. 854, the Overclassification Reduction Act. The legislation I have introduced proposes additional policy enhancements to deal with the issue of overclassification. And just as a point of reference, there are 107 known classifications that currently exist within the federal government. I'm going to repeat that. 107 known classifications within the federal government. H.R. 1323 would require the Archivist of the United States to put in place regulations pertaining to information control designations and ensure that agency heads implement these regulations. This bill would require inspectors general to conduct audits and it would make training programs available to those with the authority to control information. It is important to note that this legislation promotes a common language to be used within the federal agencies by reducing the number of informational control designations. Ensuring that the American people have access to their government is absolutely essential to our democracy. We all know that highly sensitive information needs to be carefully controlled. But most government information is not sensitive, and it should be readily available to the public and other agencies within the federal government. This legislation moves us toward that goal in a responsible manner. The bill includes no private or intergovernmental mandates, and it will have zero impact on the budgets of state, local, or tribal governments. Mr. Chairman, next week is Sunshine Week, when we take notice of the importance of open government and freedom of information. Moving forward on the Reducing Information Control Designations Act would send a clear signal that this Congress is serious about promoting transparency and openness in government. I thank the Chairman again for allowing this committee to consider this important measure, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Let me uh, agree with the sponsor that the current system that different agencies are using various vague and confusing designations to restrict access to unclassified information is just not working. We need a consistent approach that balances the need to restrict some sensitive information with the openness that our democracy requires. This bill finds that balance and it has my full support. I encourage the members to do likewise. I yield now to the ranking member of this bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I too support 1323. It is a sensible move in the right direction. Uh, as, uh, as all of us in Congress who have received briefings in the past know, we often see uh, open source material with a wrapper that says top secret on top of it. We discover that only the front page or a paragraph uh, has anything other than what you and I could Google ourselves at any time. Uh, moreover, use of terms like sensitive but not classified or, uh, uh, or official use only have turned into a, a, a not so subtle threat against individuals not simply to release something even though it may be handed to them in a hotel room, I'm sorry, in, the, in a hotel convention site for the, a vast group of people to take home on airplanes. 
we cannot have a double standard in, in our active lives, certainly in our records keeping and making material available to the public. Uh, these kinds of terms uh, leave an ambiguous mark on what could or should be given uh, to the public. Lastly, Mr. Chairman, the work we do here today serves an extremely important uh, point, which is as we eliminate these ambiguous terms and uh, enforce training that will cause people to be specific that that which is classified confidential, secret, top secret, and beyond uh, should be carefully classified, well, these other terms should be taken out of day-to-day -day use so that people really know what is available to show to anyone uh, and what is available to put on the website versus that which is, by definition, truly sensitive. So with that, Mr. Chairman, this is a good bipartisan bill. I strongly support it. And it's good to you back. Thank you very much, Congressman Eisen. Would any other members like to? Any other members? Are there any members? I now move that the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report HR 1323 of the House with the recommendations that the bill do pass. The question is on favor of reporting HR 1323 to the House. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposes? In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to, and the HR 1323 is ordered and reported. Now we call up HR. 1320. H.R. 1320, the Federal Advisory Committee Act, amendments of 2009, which was introduced by Representative Nathan Clay, uh, the chair of the Information Policy Subcommittee. I ask unanimous consent that H.R. 1320 be considered as read and open for amendments at any point. Without objection, so ordered. Without objection, I yield to the sponsor of the bill, Mr. Clay, to describe the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your expediting uh, the committee's action on the final legislation. Uh, when Congress passed the Federal Advisory Committee Act in 1972, uh, its intent was to make the Federal Advisory Committee more accountable, transparent, balanced, and independent from the influence of special interest. Somewhere along the way, these important tenants were lost, and appointments to federal advisory committees became rewards to those whose political ideology mirrored that of others and administration. In many cases, qualified individuals were excluded from these committees. For example, GAO found that some appointments to scientific and technical mm -hmm. advisory committees generated controversy due to the perception that appointments were made based on ideology rather than on expertise, or were weighted to favor one group of stakeholders over another. H.R. 1320 will improve the transparency of the advisory committee so that agencies cannot appoint uh, conflicted or biased members in secret. H.R. 1320 strengthens proper by requiring greater disclosure of timely and acceptable information on advisory committee. The bill requires disclosure of the process by which members to an advisory committee are selected, their names, and any conflicts of interest. Uh, HR 1320 requires a member to be appointed without regard to political affiliation. The bill requires an advisory committee to describe the process by which it considers recommendations and arrive at a conclusion. No longer will committees be allowed to operate in total secrecy. H.R. 1320 also clarifies who is considered a member of an advisory committee. Under this bill, agencies will no longer be able to get around FACA by having participants act like members without being formally appointed. An individual who regularly attends and participates in committee meetings as if he or she is a member will be considered a member, even if that person does not have voting rights or veto power. Uh, finally, HR 1320 closes several loopholes that allow agencies to avoid complying with FACA, such as hiring a contractor to form a commitment. 
Now, this is a good bill that will make FACA a uh, process more transparent and help federal agencies to more effectively administer the process. And I urge my colleagues to support it. Thank you for sharing my view with that. We thank you, gentlemen, for St. Louis. The Federal Advisory Committee Act was first enacted to ensure transparency. When the federal government is obtaining advice from outside interests, these amendments restore the original purpose of the act and close several loopholes that have emerged. I urge all the members to support this bill. This is good government. At this time, I'll now yield to the ranking member of the committee, Ernest Nice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, too, share your view that uh, the uh, Federal Advisory Committee Act is in fact a good piece of transparency. I will, however, be working to make it just a tad better. As the chairman and many of the members know, we have had one loophole that is not currently closed in this bill, uh, and one might say it's not even a loophole, but rather an ambiguous nature, and that is to the role of the First Lady. As many of you will remember, two, two presidents ago, First Lady Hillary Clinton played an important role in leading one of the most powerful federal advisory committees ever, highlighted uh, in 1993 that, in fact, she, seeking to work on health care, did not have at that time what one might consider proper guidance. After a prolonged court case, uh, actually a fairly short court case, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia on June 22, 1993, ruled that the First Lady was a federal employee, and therefore the Hillary Task Force on National Health Care Reform was allowed to hold meetings in secret without public disclosure. Mr. Chairman, that is true today and will not be different under this First Lady or the next First Lady. Uh, as many of us remember more recently, the role of the Vice President and his advisory uh, activities in energy was equally controversial. To chairman, there's nothing more bipartisan than us looking at all those who serve the executive branch and finding a way to consistently give them the rules of the road that allow them to seek the guidance they need under a consistent uh, set of rules and to do so uh, as transparently as possible, but if appropriate, in secret. I believe that our amendment uh, tries to do that. I know the chairman has some reservations. I hope that he will accept the amendment today and continue to work for perhaps two to three weeks, both with the uh, uh, rest of the Congress, the Senate, and most importantly, the new administration, which has asked for transparency. I might note uh, that this is not a new amendment, although uh, I realize it's new to this particular bill. Uh, Mr. Davis, in the previous Congress, had, in fact, outlined in the minority views, which I would ask to include in the record at this time, uh, the fact that, that this needed to be dealt with even when we didn't know who the next president was going to be. Mr. Chairman, I believe this is open uh, government at its finest. I realize that uh, both sides may have concerns on any language. Uh, would ask us to incorporate this language and then work to perfect it with all parties before it goes to the floor. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, any other members of the Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Reiser, would you briefly explain to me how um, your proposed amendment squares with or changes um, Section 3D of the Act, which says an individual who's not a full-time or permanent part-time officer or employee of the federal government shall be regarded as a member of the committee? Uh, what would this amendment do that that does not? Uh, what it does is it defines that the First Lady is not an employee specifically. So it takes her out of that, that role. As you know, we have a separate uh, fund which is uh, set up for the First Lady. She has operating funds to do her duty. However, she, uh, her role uh, does not enjoy, has not historically enjoyed the same... Uh, 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 her role uh, to the executive officer, to the president, enjoys absolute you know, a secrecy. Um, however, the role in, such as Eleanor Roosevelt's role in the past, was considered to be an open role, one in which uh, all, all her activities would be considered to be open. Thank you. Does anyone propose to do that? 
Yes, I would uh, have an amendment if it has. Amendment to HR 1320 offered by Mr. Issa. At the end of section 3, page 8, after line 6, add the following new subsection F. Application of FACA to spouses of the President. Section 4 of the Federal Advisory Committee Act 5 USC APP is further amended by adding at the end of the following new subsection F. Spouse of the President. A spouse of the President shall not be considered a full time or part time officer or employee of the federal government for purposes of determining the applicability of this act. And I'll, I'll be brief because I just used my opening statement to uh, measure more, more of it. Nothing in this amendment would preclude, as I understand it, and if it does, I certainly work with the chairman to correct it. Nothing would preclude a special designation by uh, the president at a given time to the first lady or first man, I guess, in the future, uh, a status of employee. In other words, uh, if, if in fact there is a specific requirement, commission, or act uh, that an administration in the future wanted to assign to a spouse, uh, none of this does not say you may not do it. It simply says for purposes of this document, the uh, spouse will be considered not to be an employee. And yes, it does respond to a, a court decision of uh, many years ago now. The intent is not to preclude an administration from seeking to use a spouse in some role other than the one that is currently funded for the First Lady or the spouse of the President, uh, since those funds are for other than an employee, and the other act uh, with some future commission or activity would be, uh, would be separate. Certainly the First Lady currently enjoys an office that allows her to bring people in meet with them and advise the president, which is a different role than this unfortunate, uh, not unfortunate, but this historic one that unfortunately First Lady Hillary Clinton was not properly protected. And it led to what I regret. It led to a period of time in which there was there was jockeying over her rights and privileges. I hope this would settle the question uh, for now without uh, in any way limiting any First Lady now or in the future from doing the job that the president wanted to do. And I, Gentlemen, I say that back. Yeah. Chairman, if I, if I may, uh, the Department of Grand Rapids, speaking of opposition, including Chairman. Gentlemen, uh, recognize the five minutes. I believe my friend from California uh, with this amendment, redefining the role of the First Lady, uh, as we have historically known. Uh, the First Lady has uh, quite a bit of flexibility in representing this country government, uh, and, I, and I think you would give this amendment pension holds her uh, into uh, some, some clearly defined uh, role. And, and, and historically, that has not been the case uh, as we have known for I, mean, I wouldn't want to start here. Let me also caution my friends in California that uh, if you're probably aware this president very guarded about With the gentleman. Yeah, and, I, I, and I'm just saying, you know, let's be careful if we want to open up that can of work. Let's not go in that direction. With the gentleman, Bill? Yes. I uh, and, I, and I appreciate the gentleman's uh, thoughts. One of the reasons I cited uh, Mr. Davis's minority views in the last Congress is, of course, at that time we had no idea who the next First Lady uh, would be. And, and this was not intended to. Uh, the current uh, First Lady, but I, I think if the gentleman would, have, would agree, we're, we are trying actually to protect the historic role of the First Lady. Uh, the only thing that taking her out of being, quote, an employee does is it says there cannot be meetings in secret as part of a, if you will, a task force or a committee that she would be bound by those rules. And uh, I might suggest that if we continue to have the First Lady as an employee, people would legitimately ask, what other employee responsibilities would she then pick up? 
Would she be eligible for expulsion? Would she be open to uh, this committee uh, calling her at any time in front of us because she's an employee working on a task force? You think about all the things we do to employees, we want to preserve her right not to have that happen. But in, in reclaiming my time, in response to that, I just think that the role of the First Lady historically and traditionally in this country has been that they've had the flexibility uh, to, uh, to involve themselves in different aspects of our government, different aspects of policy. Uh, and, and we would be inhibiting that through your amendment. Now, I, I have one more time left, the Chairman, I yield my time. I thank the gentleman. Uh, and, and I respect the, the, the ranking member's position on this. However, I, I do want to mention that you know we, we had a Republican first lady for eight years. The gentleman and, 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 and his colleagues had an opportunity to raise this issue for eight years uh, when, when Mrs. Bush was was, was the spouse. And we heard not, not a word. And now uh, with uh, the Democratic president and and, uh, and I might also mention that uh, the ranking member you know, harkens to two other uh, spouses, uh, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt, an activist, Democratic spouse of an activist uh, president, and, and Mrs. Clinton, also outspoken and activist in, during, during her husband's presidency. And I just, if we're going to do something like this, and I'm not so sure that we should, I, as a matter of fact, with the brief notice we had on this, I would certainly put myself in opposition to the gentleman's amendment. Uh, I, I think it would require a much more thorough uh, vetting of what this would really involve before we undertake something like this. This is rather a, a, an abrupt and, uh, and uh, I think very, very quick uh, amendment that I think is unwise at this point. Thank you, I yield back. Would the gentleman yield? I yield. I, I think we're talking past each other because the way I looked at this the was. From, uh, uh, Saint Louis, Saint Louis. I, yeah, I'm Susan. The gentleman, thank you. I continue to, uh, to yield my right friend. And the gentleman, I yield. The gentleman, yield. I yield back. I'm making that in five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I think we're talking past each other because, you know, in 35 years of politics, I mean, this makes it quite clear that trying to defend the first ladies or the first gentlemen's. Um, right to have that relationship um, without being triggering a lot of other issues that would should only apply to a salaried person. Um, I see this as, I just don't see how this is an affront. It's more of a, a defense of the, the privacy and the relationship between the well, president and his spouse. Yeah. If it's such a, such a, uh, a great thing, why didn't the, the gentleman or uh, any of the Republicans on that side uh, support up uh, present this amendment when, when they had a Republican first lady. It's such a good thing. Well, I, I, the gentleman, you know, I mean, I'll take, claim my time. This isn't Democrat or Republican or who's in or who's out. This is a spouse. It should have been, it should have been out, out of policy that the relationship between the president and their spouse is different and is, and, and is not an employee-employer relationship. That's all it says. I don't see this as a partisan issue. With the gentleman, you? Yes. Thank you. I might point out that the minority views I referred to and had to put in the record earlier were from May 15, 2008. That was certainly while well, Mrs. Laura Bush was uh, was first lady. But I, I might mention to the gentleman, and, and, and in trying to diffuse the situation, we we are trying not to open cans of worms. First of all, we have anti nepotism laws that Congress has passed. So if the first lady continues to be an employee, is it a violation of the anti nepotism law? But lastly, and, uh, but I hope everyone is in regard here, and perhaps we need to get to uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue for an opinion. It is a, this is only a question that comes into play when you're going to have a closed and secret uh, activity, not open to the public, not transparent, not available. Uh, certainly, Eleanor Roosevelt was famous for being very public in what she did, and, uh, and Laura Bush was very public in what she did. The idea that you would have a closed session uh, to come up with legislative policy is where where this issue came up. Now, I'm not trying to dig up uh, Hillary Clinton uh, because I think, you know, we long ago have asked the question of whether or not a first lady can be used by the president as a good advisor. I think they should be able to. 
We're only talking here as to openness of government. And so I hope the majority would agree that if we're doing a bill that's supposed to give us maximum transparency, we would include the First Lady in the transparency. Nothing in this would prohibit her from acting in that role uh, that Mrs. Clinton acted in on behalf of President Clinton. I yield back to the gentleman. Reclaiming my time, I would, I would just say that this was brought up last year Regardless of party affiliation, this is for all future, no matter what their party affiliation is. And again, this, I just think that we're kind of trying to find fault on whose side is proposing it. And I think that this committee has really been great at getting beyond that. This is strictly at trying to make sure we maintain that the relationship between a husband and wife is not the relationship of employer-employee. Yield back. Then from Massachusetts. Thank you, uh, Matt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> the point I'd like to make is, as uh, the ranking member just pointed out, um, the purpose of his wanting to propose this is to distinguish the application of the First Lady as an employee or not um, as protected under this act. Um, <coughs> Vis of being whether it's secret or not. So now we get into the point of who's determining whether the meetings are secret or not. And so first, that's where we're going to get into the whole issue here where we're, we're actually going to subject the first spouse, whomever it may be, to a new law. Because by basically not subjecting them to uh, the, the law for purposes of open meetings, you do subject them to the law for purposes of closed meetings. So, so you understand what I'm saying? You're, you're basically opening up the, uh, those, those issues of whether you can bring them in to subject them to hearings and to questions and to audits and the like. So my feeling is, is that I think we'd all be better off if we got this fully vetted by some uh, council uh, so as to we really knew what we were all talking about today rather than us spend the rest of the next few hours talking past one, of the, one another like my friend from California, Mr. Bilbray, uh, suggested we were doing because um, knowing enough about legislating by defining protections here, what you can often be doing is opening up liabilities over here if you define the protections very narrowly. And it may seem on a piece of paper that you're protecting the person, but in reality, by defining the protections in such, such a way, what you're really doing is exposing the person a lot, to a lot greater um, exposure. So I prefer, Mr. Chairman, if we would, maybe we could hold this over, get it some greater explanation as to what this is about, and maybe we don't have to spend all our time debating it anymore. All right, let me just give you my views and I'll recognize the other members. Uh, this amendment singles out the first day to say that she is not considered an employee for the purposes of fire. Let me say, we've only had this for one hour and 59 minutes. The amendment singles out, of course, uh, uh, in a situation where I think that we have to be careful and be very cautious about how we move. And this is not the time nor the bill. It is not the place for us to decide whether the First Lady is a federal employee. And this is not the way to do that. This amendment is a response, of course, to the Clinton Health Care Task Force. And of course, uh, you know that's gone through the court system and all that. And in making this determination, the court looked at factors such as the First Lady's role in aiding the President in the performance of his duties, and the fact that the President's spouse is supported by a substantial staff of federal employees. The court found the question of whether the First Lady is a federal employee to be complex. Now, if they found it to be complex, I don't think with an hour and 58 minutes that we can make a decision as to what should happen. I really think that this is something that we should move very cautiously with, and of course, uh, and I think that we require more time and we need to be vetted more. 
Uh, this is something that we should approach with greater deliberation than we can provide this day. And I'm willing to support my colleague to address any legitimate concerns he may have, but I must urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment because this amendment, you know, uh, uh, sometimes you know, we do things and do them in haste, and we create serious problems. So I would suggest that we stop and hold off and take a look at this further before moving forward with it. So I would be delighted to hear from you. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I agree with everything you said, and, and I certainly agree with uh, my friend Mr. Kennedy uh, from Massachusetts. Uh, I'm sorry, Lord. Uh, Sorry, I hate to do that to you. Sorry, thank you. I've heard that. You pick a state, I'm there for you. Uh, all kidding aside, uh, I think Mr. Kennedy really did hit on something. Um, I'm not positive that this is the best perfecting uh, amendment. Um, I'm equally willing to define the First Lady as a federal employee at all times. I'm not sure that would be accepted well by uh, the majority. It is perhaps much better that we take a week or two, seek uh, professionals that we can, we can both rely on, and come up with the best decision as to when the First Lady is in fact a federal employee when she isn't. Perhaps a way to say she isn't unless the President designates and allow for a reasonable designation. I have no intention on digging up, if you will, Hillary uh, Health Care Task Force as, a, as an example, I think it simply made us aware that we needed to define that role in a way that was fair to the First Lady and the President. I'm perfectly willing to modify this thing at a future time, uh, withdraw it today, modify it to meet a, uh, a mutually agreeable uh, amendment that brings the manager's amendment that would be precisely what every First Lady and President would like to have going forward. And with that, I, I thank you, Chair. I yield the gentleman from California. Thank you so much, Doug. Mr. Chairman, and I want to uh, thank the ranking member for understanding uh, that this amendment is not appropriate in this bill. If we're talking about employees and who should be an employee, that needs to be a standalone bill where we can talk about who is an employee and who's not. Because as a federal employee, certain benefits accrue to you. If you're not an employee, there are certain places you cannot go, uh, identification, there are a whole lot of other issues. And I think to amend this bill is the wrong and inappropriate place to deal with this issue. So I appreciate uh, your understanding. And uh, if you want to look into the role of the spouse of the president as an employee or not an employee, I think that needs to be handled separately. I appreciate your understanding. Uh, we're not ready to accept an amendment as I am hearing from my colleagues to this bill at this time. I think it would take far more information as to the status of employee or not employee for the spouse of the president. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you, gentlemen from California. Now you the gentleman from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank uh, Mr. Issa for uh, his willingness to withdraw the amendment at this time. I, I just wanted to plead for the value uh, of a creative ambiguity. Um, the fact of the matter is, since 1793, this republic has managed somehow to allow the first spouse uh, to, uh, to remain undefined in statute. And there's been value in uh, our first uh, all First Ladies uh, have served uh, remarkable roles in wartime and in peace. Um, and, uh, you know, when Congress has perhaps unduly interfered in that role, we've had to have presidents actually uh, intervene. Um, President Lincoln had to come to Congress and ask Congress to beg off on an investigation of his spouse during the middle of the Civil War because of. Uh, Unfounded accusations about her so-called southern sympathies because she was from of where she was from. Um, I don't think Congress does itself proud in interfering in that relationship. I think the Republic has benefited from uh, spousal relationships in the White House, and I think we should let it alone. So, at least speaking to this member, I will have to hear a compelling case 
for why the Congress, after over 200 years, should suddenly resort to a statutory circumspection of the role of the first spouse in the future. Well, the gentleman you Oh, uh, I, I'd like to answer your question because I think it's a good one. What we're doing in, is simply saying, for purposes of this act, we either choose to say she is a federal employee or say she isn't, and then know what the consequences are. And we're really only acting in reaction to a appellate court decision that settled the question back in 1993, something that now departed, uh, not departed, but just no longer Congressman Tom Davis, had made very clear in the last Congress needed to be dealt with regardless of who the First Lady was. You understand that if, if the First Lady is a federal employee, then this committee has all kinds, and she's been determined uh, by previous courts, uh, we have all kinds of responsibilities to deal with other questions about federal uh, about the First Lady. Remembering that over the years, long after Abe Lincoln, we have decided to give money, not give money, set up an office of, of the First Lady. So we have, as a Congress, changed the role of First Lady. I'm not trying to change the role. I'm happy with any de definition that comes out, but ambiguity in that you have to go to the court every time to decide whether an act uh, applies or not is, is not good to create that view. I appreciate it. Thank you my time, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, the point being made by the ranking member, but again, I would just say, um, I think what you're hearing is a lot of skepticism from your colleagues, at least on this side of the aisle, as to the necessity of statutory remedy. And if, if the ranking member wants to make a case, I, I welcome getting the information. Um, I also would caution that with a new president, just uh, recently inaugurated, uh, the perception, as several of my colleagues have, have mentioned, is that this looks unduly partisan. And I know that's not the intention of the ranking member. And therefore, I, I applaud the wisdom of this withdrawing this amendment at this time. I would hope that we would uh, have more information provided to us before we see it again. Yes. I'm happy to yield to Mr. Just to, in, in, in reinforcing my, my colleague's point, I just want to point out that this we are considering the, the status of the individuals under the Federal Advisory Committee Act. There is a section, Section E, uh, just before the gentleman's amendment, that defines or, or, or uh, delineates the fact that a special uh, special employee uh, or, or appointment to a Federal Advisory Committee, of which we have thousands. Uh, that will not make them a, a quote, full-time or part-time employee. So we, we are actually in this act and in these sections defining the status of people who are appointed to advisory committees. What the gentleman is attempting to do by the amendment is saying, okay, uh, the first lady, by the fact that she is married to the president, her status is now going to be affected by, by this amendment. It is incongruous uh, and, and I think uh, outside the the, uh, the mandate of, of the original act, the Federal, Federal Advisory Committee Act, to try to change the status of the spouse of the president. Uh, and I agree with Ms. Watson that if, if we're going to affect the, the, the status of, of the spouse of the president, we ought to do that with, with all due consideration to every aspect of, of that position and, and the vulnerabilities that that brings in. Uh, what we're trying to do in, in this act is, is really identify special uh, positions that are brought in as an advisory position within these uh, advisory committees. And, and there are, you know, as the act originally states, it's, there are thousands of committees, boards, commissions, councils, and similar groups which have been established to advise offices and ag agencies in the executive branch of the federal government. That's what the act is getting at. And, and what the gentleman is doing is, is ignoring that and saying, oh, but we have, uh, at this point, we have the first lady. And uh, she has some, you know, undoubted influence on, on the president. And we're going to try to regulate that within the contour contours of this act. And I think and I yield back. Thank you, thank you very much. And the, and the time has expired. And now I yield to the gentleman from Maryland. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, first of all, let me uh, go back to what you said. Uh, your statement was absolutely brilliant. And it's it, and basically what you, and what I can buy what you 
you said, with what the ranking member said, it convinces me that this is not an issue for us to address today. Um, the ranking member has made it clear that apparently there are significant ramifications to uh, what happens if we were to adopt this amendment. Um, and while he says that it's to protect the First Lady, and I, I have no reason to doubt that, um, I, I, I seriously uh, want to look and see um, exactly what it means, for example, with regard to subpoenas. See, I haven't heard that word used yet, but I was here when Travelgate took place, and I saw what went, uh, how uh, folks were subpoenaed, uh, and documents and whatever. It was very interesting. So I don't know what this means. In other words, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it because of that, but at least we, we need to understand the ramifications. Another very interesting thing is that this is a case that was decided in 1993. As the ranking member and the chairman said, and the chairman, Mr. The chairman, I thank you for quoting the case where they said, the court said, after deliberating, I'm sure, very carefully, that this is a very complex issue. And if a court uh, disposed of it back in 1993, then um, it may be best that we take some more time. But there's a last, one final point, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't, sometimes what happens is that, um, and I've, 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 I've talked about this a lot, how we will make a proposal in hopes that uh, something short of it will prevail. And I don't want to give the impression that I sit here ready to change the law because my distinguished colleague, the ranking member, will bring back something that's less than as far as he wanted to go. Um, I don't want to leave that impression uh, because as far as I'm concerned, uh, I think the 1993 case is fine. Uh, and I just think that, again, when we are talking about protection, and I go back to the gentleman's statement from Virginia, what is protection to one person may be just the opposite to another. And I think we have to be careful with that. And so, Mr. Chairman, I'm not going to take any more than the next time, and I, uh, I yield that. Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. George. I got to yield uh, time to the uh, ranking member. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I know we, we seem to be going around in circles. I, I don't want to leave the impression that this is not important or that we don't have to uh, determine for this purpose the role of the First Lady based on historic precedents. And I, and I hope the other side will understand my willingness to withdraw and ask us to come back in two or three weeks after we've all had time to evaluate alternatives is based simply on the fact that I am not proposing today the amendment of the only possible amendment. The truth is we could define that the First Lady is, at all times, an employee and then an exemptor from any other considerations uh, that might come from it, and that would take a little bit of language. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that in 1993, and to a certain extent, although a different example, with the Vice President, both parties, at times, made a and travel date, as you mentioned, I've forgotten about that. They made a point of, well, wait a second, can you have these deliberations in secret? Do they have to be open? What are the rules? This is the Committee of Transparency and Government. Therefore, we set the rules as to what is transparent. What are the rules for a meeting, an organization, uh, groups that come together to advise the president? Now, when the vice president had a meeting with oil executives, I certainly was here. I heard your side of the aisle complain vigorously. I was not on this committee at the time, but I want to be sympathetic to all the complaints that have come in and said, every single one of them, we should have a set of rules that future presidents, vice presidents, first ladies, spouses of vice presidents, understand what their do's and don'ts are. Can they have an open meeting? Can they have a closed meeting? If it's only federal employees in the room, do they have an expectation that that's consultation for and with the president versus if they bring in uh, non-federal employees uh, to advise them, 
whether they be business leaders, union executives, healthcare professionals, whatever, what is the expectation? Now that is what this committee is supposed to do and do well. Uh, this bill does seem to be the appropriate place to define, as to this bill, whether or not other persons, and I may have been insufficient in only naming the First Lady, but other persons shall be defined either as a federal employee, if they act this way, or not a federal employee. So, Mr. Chairman, although I'm willing to, uh, to have this thing go back for reconsideration outside of today's markup, and, and eager actually to do that, it's because I do not have a preference. I only say that we have to define it one way or the other in this bill because we don't want to have another repeat under this administration of a first lady not knowing at a given time, doing a particular job, what the rules are for transparency to the American people. Let me yield back to Mr. Jordan. Mr. Chairman, I, Mr. Chairman, I do that. Let me say that we had four votes in about 10 minutes. So I just want you to keep that in mind. I've listened, to, I've listened to this discussion and I'm glad that my uh, friend from California is going to uh, take another look at this. And when you look at it, I uh, hope that you look at it within the context of the historic role of First Ladies. And I think it would be good for this committee to uh, communicate with uh, those who have served in that capacity to ask them for, uh, for some guidance about what works and what doesn't work. Because we're talking about the practical application of laws that we make here. We can have a law in theory that in practice is a nightmare. We do not want to diminish the role of a first lady or in the future of a first man. We do not want to create a circumstance where uh, Mrs. Obama will not be able to fully function in her capacity as uh, the premier representative of the United States, no other than, of course, the president of the United States. We have to be cognizant of the time in which this particular proposal is being offered. It's a time when of enormous change in America, where there's so many people who take great pride in, in our first lady, and we have to make sure that we don't do anything to diminish her or to diminish her role. Now, I, I have great confidence in, in the integrity and, and in the goodwill of my friend from California. But I, I would really ask that uh, we, we have a deep reflection on this before we uh, bring something up that could have consequences that would, I'm sure, be uh, contrary to what, uh, uh, what we would really want and what the American people would want. The, the First Lady doesn't belong to this Congress. First Lady don't belong to the Congress of the United States. She belongs to America. Thank you very much. Any other? Let me just say that um, um, I don't think we should allow one issue to stop this bill from moving forward. And of course, um, there's a lot of issues that we have to examine before. And I think that um, that's an issue that we should uh, have a hearing on. That's an issue that we should have a bill that stands alone, I don't think it should be an amendment. So uh, uh, now I move the Committee on Oversight and Government to form into HR 1320 to the House with the recommendation that the bill do pass. The question is, are we favorably reporting HR 1320 to the House? All those uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, a, a quorum for this committee, uh, although assumed, is not present, so I would move uh, that we do not have a quorum. quorum. We would call for a vote, and then, of course, uh, we would see in terms of what happens with the vote. So, uh, at this time, uh, uh, we would now call for a vote. Mr. Towns. Aye. Mr. Towns votes aye. Mr. Kendorski. Aye. Mrs. Maloney. Mr. Cummings. Aye. Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Kucinich. Aye. Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Tierney. Aye. Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Clay? Aye. Mr. Clay votes aye. Ms. Watson? Aye. Ms. Watson votes aye. Mr. Lynch? Aye. Mr. Lynch votes aye. Mr. Cooper? Mr. Connolly? Aye. Mr. Connolly votes aye. Ms. Norton? Mr. Kennedy? Aye. Mr. Kennedy votes aye. Mr. Davis? Mr. Van Hollen? 
Mr. Cuellar? Aye. Mr. Cuellar votes aye. Mr. Hodes? Aye. Mr. Hodes votes aye. Mr. Murphy from Connecticut? Mr. Welch? Mr. Foster? Ms. Spear? Mr. Dreamhouse? Aye. Mr. Dreamhouse votes aye. Mr. Isa? No. Mr. Isa votes no. Mr. Burton? Yes. Mr. Burton, Burton votes aye. Mr. No, Matthew? No. I'm not sorry, right. but someone said yes. Pardon. <laughs> Mr. McHugh? Mr. Micah? Mr. Sauer? Mr. Platts? Mr. Duncan? Mr. Turner? Mr. Westmoreland? Mr. Nick Henry? Mr. Bill Bray? Mr. Jordan? Mr. Blake? Mr. Fort Perry? Mr. Shavitz? Mr. Shock? votes aye. Mr. Kanjorski? Ms. Maloney? Aye. Ms. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Cummings? Aye. Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Kucinich? Aye. Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Tierney? Aye. Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Clay? Aye. Mr. Clay votes aye. Ms. Watson? Aye. Ms. Watson votes aye. Mr. Lynch? Aye. Mr. Lynch votes aye. Mr. Cooper? Mr. Connolly? Aye. Mr. Connolly <coughs> votes aye. Ms. Norton? Mr. Kennedy? Aye. Mr. Kennedy votes aye. Mr. Davis from Illinois? Mr. Van Hollen? Mr. Cuellar? Aye. Mr. Cuellar votes aye. Mr. Hodes? Aye. Mr. Hodes votes aye. Mr. Murphy from Connecticut? Mr. Welch? Mr. Foster? Mr. Driehaus? Aye. Mr. Driehaus votes aye. Mr. Issa? Mr. 
the foster goes on. I'm going to vote. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, there are 16 ayes and one no. H.R. 1387, Electronic Message Preservation Act, which was introduced by Representative Paul Holmes. Uh, all half standards considered that H.R. 30, 1387 be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Without objection, so ordered. Without objection, I yield to the sponsor of the bill, Mr. Holmes, to describe the bill. I thank the chairman and the ranking member for moving this important bill to a markup. Uh, to increase government transparency. Uh, I am a strong supporter of transparency and accountability at all levels of government, and that is why I introduced the Electronic Message Preservation Act, a bill to preserve White House records as well as those records of other federal agencies. This legislation passed the House uh, in the last Congress, but was not considered by the Senate. The bill is the product of an investigation conducted by the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee. The report of that investigation revealed significant deficiencies in the preservation of email by the White House and other federal agencies. During the Bush administration, numerous White House officials used email accounts maintained by the Republican National Committee, the RNC, which regularly deleted the emails from its servers. Emails sent by White House officials over these RNC accounts included emails concerning official government business. In addition, the Bush White House could not account for hundreds of days worth of official White House emails sent and received between 2003 and 2005. At the time of these inexplicable losses, the White House used an email archiving system that a former White House information technology officer described as primitive. Other administrations, including President Clinton's, had encountered problems preserving email records. Now, at the beginning of a new administration, with new modes and tools of communication continually deployed, it is critical for Congress to act to ensure that these obstacles to transparency and accountability don't continue. To ensure the retention of these important records, the legislation directs the archivist of the National Archives to establish standards for the capture, management, and preservation of White House emails and other electronic messages and to certify that the system meets its requirements. The bill also directs the archivist to issue regulations requiring federal agencies to preserve electronic messages in an electronic format. These regulations must cover at a minimum the capture, management, preservation, and electronic retrieval of these electronic records and must be implemented within four years of the enactment of the act. As more and more official business is conducted via electronic mail, Congress must work to ensure that federal agencies have effective practices in place to provide the transparency and accountability to which the citizens of this country are entitled. I urge my colleagues to support this measure on the United. And this time I yield to the ranking member. Mr. Chairman, if I can take this time and offer my, my amendment at this time, since it's not a controversial thing, I'm going to apologize to the ALE, I'll just take this time. Yes. Okay, and I've been back. The amendment has amended the desk. I ask you to have consent to the waiver of the ALE. So ordered. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I won't go into reading the details. This is an amendment that's previously been offered and accepted. It was in the past bill last time. Uh, my predecessor had offered it. I, I felt appropriate that it should be in the bill when it leaves here. Uh, I think it's non-controversial, and I, I uh, hope that uh, it will be taken in that way, since it is what we voted last time, and we ask it to be uh, yield. And I'm going to accept it. Uh, and I yield back.
1387 to the House. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? In the pen of the chair, the ayes have it. And the motion is agreed to, and H.R. 1387 is ordered reported. The next order of business is nine postal naming bills and resolutions. I ask unanimous consent that these resolutions be considered and brought and as read and open to amendment at any point. The resolution include H. Res 178, introduced by Representative Bill Pasquale. Uh, this measure expresses support for National Brain Injury Awareness Month, which is commemorated annually during the month of March. H. Res 211, introduced by Representative Lynn Boosie. Uh, this measure expresses support for the goals, ideas, and history of National Women's History Month, which is commemorated annually during the month of March. H.R. 918 introduced by Representative Brian Higgins. This bill designates a facility of the United States Postal Service in Jamestown, New York, as the Stan Medine Post Office. H.R. 955 introduced by Representative Jay Inslee. This bill designates a facility of the United States Postal Service in Rolling Bay, Washington as the John Bud Hawk Post Office. H.R. 987, introduced by Representative Jason Altmaier. This bill designates the facility of the United States Postal Service in Freedom, Pennsylvania, as